Next, uh, this will be the last uh, session of the Live Ops Landscape track before we move on to Mastering Multiplayer. Uh, up next, we have a panel uh, talking about the best practices for getting the most out of your Live Ops strategy. I'd like to welcome Ewan Morris, uh, Kulev Platonov, Josh Nielsen, Yoav Kadim, David Tyler, and Samantha Pang. Fantastic. How is everybody today? All good? Surviving? Yeah. Barely surviving? Yeah, fantastic. We've got a woo back there. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, won't, I won't stay up here because you're not here to hear me speak. If you are here to hear me speak, I'm very sorry. Um, we have um, a number of lovely panellists today who are going to be giving their thoughts on live up strategy. And I will be providing my questions, which is, yes, usually how a panel goes. But bear with me. This is my first time doing this. So um, we're going to start off with just the basics and just let everybody introduce themselves in no particular order. Um, Hi, my name is Yoav Kedem. Um, I've been a founding VP product at Beachbomb that was recently acquired by Voodoo, then moved on to manage uh, Heart of Vegas, a social casino game. Uh, and in the past few years, I've been consulting game companies, mostly in the social casino space, mobile rewarded games, but any other, to improve their uh, revenues and performance through product delivery and live ops. Good morning, everyone. I'm David Tyler. I work at Tencent. I'm the head of uh, Western Europe Publishing. Uh, long time in the game industry. Most of my career was at Activision. I was uh, the VP there for Call of Duty. So I've sort of come from PC and console and now jumped over to, uh, to mobile. Hey, everyone. I'm Josh. I'm from Canada, as you'll tell by the amazing accent. <laughs> and I uh, run a game studio up there called uh, ESA Games. Uh, we make games. We also publish them, mostly in uh, idle. Uh, genre, we're looking at other genres as well. We mean, RuPaul, Drag Race, Superstar, Trailer Park Boys, The Office, Somehow We Manage, and the Doctor Who's games coming out really soon. I'm Samantha Pang. I'm head of customer success at HelpShift. We're a conversational AI and automation platform working with over 300 customers to provide player support inside the game. Prior to that, I was at DNA Games for six years and working with different teams across the live ops operations. Uh, hi, I'm Glee Platonov. I'm a founder of Outloud Games. We're uh, developing like mobile games, mostly like idle genre, like, <laughs> uh, and also co-founder of Doc Howl Games, a PC and console developer. I'm in the industry like for 10 years, so I saw some bad stuff that's going on and some good stuff that's going on. So hope, hopefully, we can share our experience and be uh, helpful for everyone here. Okay, fantastic. And your first question for 500 pounds. No. Um, so, obviously, Pocket, uh, Pocket Gamer Connect, we're mainly talking about the mobile landscape. So, my first question to you would be how Live Ops differs on mobile compared to something like, say, PC or console? So, I can <coughs> share a perspective. Um, so, it differs in a number of different ways. If you think about, um, first of all, how the industry has been set up, for a lot of the Western console and PC publishers, well, worldwide PC and console publishers, a lot of those organizations have got their legacy um, from a retail, physical retail business. Their teams are not necessarily being set up, uh, and that's why everyone's having to adapt to a more digital business model, moving from physical goods to digital, uh, and neither of them being really set up from a legacy standpoint to focus on live ops, right? So the collaborations with studios, uh, even talking to studios is quite difficult. Often, uh, lots of these Western publishers are American-based as well. So I think, and just getting access to the data is quite difficult. So I think the first thing to probably say is that the, the, the mobile has been built very much with agility, with speed of decision-making, with fast iterative, uh, fast iterative mindset. Whereas it's just not the case for PC and console, it hadn't been the case, which is why those companies are trying to transition. So I think just the build and the, uh, the DNA of the companies is very, very different. Um, there's obviously also some more fundamental things, like when it comes to actually publishing content, like back on Call of Duty, obviously we'd, we'd be working with the first parties, Microsoft and Sony, to actually get the content QA'd and approved onto the platform. So again, like you start to see some of the contrasts between uh, in the industry where mobile is highly iterative and PC and console, it's trying to increase its agility, but it's a, it's a, uh, it's a sort of evolution rather than a revolution. Okay, 
Fantastic. Is there anybody else who'd like to sort of add on to that, those thoughts? Yeah, I'll add. Mobile games have much shorter session time, right? Play time. Um, there's so many apps that are launched on the App Store every day to try to keep the player inside the game becomes more important, especially when you're providing support. Players want to get their questions answered, their problems solved, and get back to playing the game as quickly as possible. So I think that's why providing support in mobile games is so important and collecting that feedback as early on as possible to continue iterating on it to build that community early on kind of determines the success of your game down the line. Okay. Fantastic. Um, and now we'll move on to the next question, which is, this is going to be a, very, a bit of a complex one. Are there any common misconceptions you see about live ops from both players and developers, or either or? I'll start, <laughs> and then uh, while you guys think about it. Tough um, question. What, I mean, we work with over 300 gaming companies globally, any kind of genres, and the same thing we continue to see as a misconception is developers often think that um, support should be the last thing they think about, and support is something they can put in place once the game is live. Um, that is often the mistake they make, because when the game blows up and they have a massive successful title, um, they can't get the support tool or the support team together in time. Um, a lot of our customers can speak to that, and we've tried to help them set up a help shift in three days um, and uh, help them get the automation up and running while they figure out the human side of things. Um, so I think it's just that it's super important, whether the game is kind of in the pre-launch or post-launch phase, to have that feedback loop set up early, even if for players to give you that feedback just to show that you're listening to them is super important. And then having a tool in place like Help Shift that you can scale up as your game gets through kind of beta, closed beta, and then into global launches, that really helps to kind of plan your strategy around live ops as well. Fantastic. Um, <clears throat> so during the work with some of my clients, and obviously when they come to a consultant, it means that something is not going great. They often do a lot of things without thinking without properly planning and focusing. So the first thing I would suggest to do is not to try to tackle everything at the same time, just concentrate on simple problems and, and progress from there. That's a very common mistake. I see where people are just running 10 campaigns at the same time without actually thinking about each and every one properly. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest changes has been in the last couple of years is you have to effectively plan that. If you're a big developer, small developer, publish or self-publish, you really have to look into what what's going to go into your product and what that looks like over the years. So that's content planning and making sure you have an effective live op. Like a lot of times developers, I think, think live ops is just updating your game, but that's just game development. You have to maintain, update your game, make sure it works well. and fix bugs and do all that, but it's more about how does that content fit into your evergreen strategy so you can keep your game up um, for years and years. And the biggest change right now, I think, is onboarding uh, mechanics of your game and how that works. Like, look at a, a new game that's really successful but is really slow and rolling out stuff on Live Ops, like Marvel Snap. It takes the first two or three sessions just to really get through that onboarding to, to teach the player, and then it's really just one track, you know they're going to roll out more, but it's taking more. I think when we built games five years ago, it was more about build the game, if it's successful, tack on live ops, and now you have to plan, if it is successful, what are you going to add for live ops? Because it's really hard to just like, let's pivot the, let's pivot the entire team and let's throw in a leaderboard. What would those leaderboard cohorts look like? How will that affect your players? How will that affect support? You need all of that built in, and it just takes a lot more planning. Okay, fantastic. Oh, uh, yeah. yeah, I want to actually add a little bit to, to Josh because uh, back in the days when I used to work like outsourcing, we worked with many companies, even a big one, and we faced the problem that many companies was waiting that the game showed like good KPIs and then only add like live ops tools uh, and stuff like that. And that moment it's already super late. You need to scale the game if you got KPIs. So basically you need to plan your live ops tools and infrastructure on a stage when you start developing the game as well. And it's very important. And that's a thing that a lot of developers uh, don't think about when we start doing it. Um, so my next question is a little bit redundant because it kind of comes under what you guys have been talking about here. Do you 
Is there kind of this idea that live ops for a lot of studios is a get out of jail free card, or is it more like they're just thinking, we'll kick this can down the road and we'll take it up? Um, so definitely not. In my, you have to think about your core game, the meta game, and the live ops player. Now, the live ops would only kick in at a certain stage in the game. So if you think uh, too much further, further, further down, you might uh, miss the targets that you currently need with the current KPI. Mm. Now, if your game is not doing well, then I don't believe live ops will help it. So first of all, think about the game, correct your meta, correct the core loop, and then go ahead and fix the, the live ops because this will take you from a B to an A plus, but will not take you from F to A. Yeah, it's, a, it's actually an idea to be prepared to use all the live op tools, but don't use it if the core is not working. <laughs> because you basically can ruin the concept in, in a way. <laughs> Just want to ask on that? Yeah, speaking from a developer point of view, because we have, we develop, but we also publish, it, developers can also get so deep down that uh, having to measure and put in live ops and do that until their core game's like working, right? So you meet with lots of smaller teams or teams that are going into live ops for the first time. They're spending all of their energy on making sure they're measuring, but if you don't hit a certain level of success first, then, then don't bother. You need that core kick guys mm -hmm. to work there. And then I thought the last talk was really good because uh, I think sometimes we forget about what our games look like from a player point of view, a customer point of view, and that point that Mobility Wear had was really good. That said, if I don't see live events working in the game, I just assumed it's not working, <laughs> like it's broken. Because everyone has live events in your game that have to do with uh, holidays, you know, Halloween or whatever. If they don't see that in there, they're like, Is something wrong with the game? Is it not working? So it's interesting how it's come that far. That if you don't have anything happening in your game, even in super casual, uh, games that never had live ops before, then people just assume it's not working right. I think from a support perspective, you know, whether um, the game is actively having live events or if it's a game that's ramping down, it's just super important that you have support in place because if you don't and the player needs help, they can leave a bad review. Um, they can go to the community and say that you're not helping them with their problems. It's just a matter of being able to, um, to you know, make sure that you prioritize the resources accordingly. You know, more effort is going to put on content updates and FAQs for newer games and up and coming games. But even for ramping down games, just important that they have a channel and that there's still minimal resources supporting them with their questions. Are you seeing more companies that are um, because in the PC world, when I worked in that, it was more like that. I think mobile games is probably going to go more about how do we use tools to ask the community what they want next or what events they want rerun. Are you seeing more companies? Yeah, absolutely. Feedback. So I think the mobile players love when gaming companies listen to them and they feel like they're being heard because you know, in live ops, mo mobile compared to PC console is so much more agile. You know, you can kind of tune the events, you can tune the characters, the type of items, you can run campaigns based on what the players want to see up and coming in the game. So we are seeing that, um, you know, support teams are using our tool to get the data, to get the feedback and share it back with the developers. And that creates a much stronger community and um, the players feel like that you're listening to them and they'll play your game longer. So absolutely, mobile is very much more agile and feedback focused compared to PC console. Okay. Um, and now we're, we're, we're gonna move on to what I would say is, what would you say the biggest change for Live Ops has been over the past year, just on sort of every level, really? Because obviously last year has been a, a big major change for the market, so. Well, speaking to, to my roots on PC and console, I mean, obviously the big change has been the move into the free-to-play space. Um, I think many games started five, six, eight years ago to um, you know, introduce uh, microtransactions um, and you know, some form of live ops. 
Uh, I remember on Call of Duty, I think it was back in 2012, uh, ca bacon wrapped camos. I think it was Black Ops 2, maybe post season on Black Ops 2. So I think one of the biggest changes has been this movement from um, PC and console titles in particular to free to play and with free to play. You know, they're, they're trying to take the best parts of brand building from sort of traditional PC and console and then couple it with what works really well in a uh, you know, live ops environment for, um, for, for mobile as well. And I think you know, lots of companies are struggling to find that balance still right now, but that's the, it's sort of in, in pursuit of more engaged players always is, is what everyone's trying to get to. So in the past year, what I've seen a lot of casual companies adopting social casino strategies. Because in social casino, from the beginning, it was a very niche market with small target audience, and therefore, we always had to think about monetization, firstly, and then retention. And now as the game is, it's, it's hard, becomes harder and harder to generate, to be our right positive, more casual companies, different genres, try to adapt and, and adopt techniques from social casino into their games to improve their performance. It's about like building worlds now, I think. So it's about building spaces for your players to play evergreen. It doesn't matter if you have, I never thought we'd build an idle game and still be supporting it five years later and it's still growing year over year because um, people want more content, especially content on maybe shows that don't run anymore. And it's a lot more integration that is kind of coming over from PC console to be, um, if that's, someone from one game is coming over to the other game or you're having um, live events with integrations, you're seeing that in small and large games, you're kind of seeing that come back again, which I think is really good because then people will play games for years now and you have to plan for that versus we we're always about before making a new game, what's the next one? Instead we're kind of looking at making you know franchises and, and expanding those worlds over and over. And I think you're seeing that in TV too. So. Uh, you know, with The Last of Us, you're having a show and then there's going to be more content It's going to drive people back to playing those games or they forgot about the game and then there's going to be other um, products that are going to come from that and I think that's great because it just kind of all feeds into that and I think games can be a big engagement in there as well. Um, I think during COVID, because the world was in lockdown, I think everybody saw that more people were playing games and stayed at home and played games. Even people that didn't play games before played games. So we saw an immediate transition for players who really started embracing automation and then gaming companies um, that were skeptical soon followed. So we saw a massive adoption of automation across our platform um, when you know gaming companies couldn't get the remote work set up for the agents to get back online. They just set up these bots to help the players with the problems and so that they can get back to playing the game as the ticket volume was also going up. So um, now we definitely see more gaming companies embrace the automation as well and players are getting used to it and it doesn't impact CSAT as much anymore. Yeah, I, I would say that uh, in generally the important like trend that is going on and just rising is like adaptability to everything that's going on and adaptability to changes because uh, I remember my work during like game loft like five seven years ago we released like one update two update per month right now we're releasing like a couple of days per week to do some ab testing or other stuff improving the tools and so on and so on and that's important because marketing is growing competition is growing the amount of possibilities that you have is growing and uh, it's very difficult especially you're like smaller mid-sized studio it's very difficult for you to adapt so you use like partners tools third party solutions publishers that can help and then actually can help you to grow and can help you to to handle these changes and 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 grow as soon as possible and i think that's where everyone is going right now and you're like this tolerance to adaptability is actually will be a key factor like in years like years whether you can adapt or, or you will just like drop that somewhere so that's the thing <laughs> yeah, yeah that change in the last five years has been pretty yeah. big about where we used to have to push builds all the time and now it's like we have to develop tools or use tools off the shelf to be able to push everything from the back end whenever you want yeah, yeah, yeah. and to do that constantly it's more like the uh, the days of Facebook where you could just like push something out like right away to fix it 
versus that. So it's constantly testing your online stores to make sure like. And, and, and usually you want to test much more than you actually have capabilities and tools to do. So it's just a plan. Funnily enough, that actually brings me on to my next question, uh, which is what key tools do you think that people should be familiar with for their live ops strategy, just on every level, basically? Oh, I, I, I can start. So uh, definitely, uh, it's very actually a tricky question because it really depends on your strengths of your team mm. and the capabilities that you have. Because sometimes you might not have the right people, and even if you bring the right tool, you won't be able to operate. It's not one size fits all. Yeah, so, <laughs> and uh, I, I think that it's very important to have possibility to A-B test your monetization as a key thing because it's really, really well connected to your user acquisition, right? Mm -hmm. You should acquire cheaper than you actually get from the the user. So, uh, and usually there is like very very um, easy solutions that you can do. And there is a lot of 3D uh, parties, and there is a lot of publishers who has this possibility. So you can do it. And if you don't want or you don't have these possibilities, you actually can even do like a very simple solution somewhere on the back end with uh, sending like at least one two A/B tests per update. It's very important. And uh, second thing, I think that the customer care is very important. Uh, like help shift right and uh, because you can automate a lot back in the days I remember there was like I don't know like 50 people working in a customer care in different languages right now right now you just need one wise guy who can set up everything and let's go you know automate and work with users and and yes users are ready and uh, uh, ready to talk to a machine basically right now to solve their problems because th th that's a key and uh, third one is probably the user acquisition. So you definitely need, um, again, what, depend on your capabilities and resources, you need a marketing research tool to understand your competition. You definitely need some tools that will help you run the campaigns on uh, lower levels and, and target like users working this piece and stuff like that. And, uh, and you have a, a nice dashboard to analyze it because you can gather the data, but it's very important to analyze it. Thank you for being a customer, Glib. Thank you for selling HelpShift. Um, so I, I think HelpShift works really well for gaming companies um, because we can adapt to any size. We can scale up or down. We can apply automation at your comfort level, or we can recommend how to do it because we have work with hundreds of gaming companies across the world based on the problems and the KPIs they're trying to achieve. Um, our tool has a lot of segmentation in it, so you know who the player is. Players want you to know um, that you would you know who you're talking to and how to prioritize them. If they're VIP, you got to give them the white glove service. If they're never going to spend any money, then you can send them to an FAQ, make them self-serve before you actually get them to, to a human, right? That's how you are able to optimize your costs on support because support is always seen as a cost center, but with the recent changes, it can become a profit center if you utilize that team and the tool in your live op strategy. Um, so segmentation is important, and then automation is important, to Glib's point, because if you have a problem, let's say you launch an update and there's a bug, you can just use a bot and tell them that you're working on it, and no human has to touch that. And once you fix it, you just let them know you're, you fixed it, give them some rewards based on whether they're VIP or free player, and you can do all of that without adding extra human cost to it. So it's very scalable. I'm a big fan of using, uh, especially if you're an independent developer or you're self-publishing, I'm a big fan now of using all the tools that are available on the platforms that you're building on. Um, start there and then upgrade as you need. So um, Google has some amazing tools you can use, including like uh, backend push, like remote config that you can use to start on, and it's great. Um, Unity has a lot of tools. Apple has a lot of tools that are right out of the box that you can use, and you already you already have these integrated because you're building on these platforms. So use those, then go out and there's pretty much anything you need off the shelf to augment and to add on there. But like I said before, there's a lot of developers that get too into uh, all the talks and spend their time building tools and A/B tests before they make sure your game is fantastic and amazing. You have to focus on your core loop of your game and make sure your players are, are loving it and then augment from there so you know what you're testing. But, but that's not the core of what you need to do for live ops. You need to make sure that you have, those, you have that retention and engagement up and then add on all that other stuff afterwards. 
Yeah, just to add, um, I think data is at the heart of a lot of this conversation. Um, I think without, you know, you'd be amazed at how many uh, games get published when the data's not. There's either too little data and it's too sketchy and thin, so you can't really draw insights from it, or, or it's too much. And sometimes it's, there's a staggering amount of data, and if it's not in the right structure, it, it, you know, we used to talk about trying to boil the ocean. You can't boil the ocean, it's just impossible. So you've got to be realistic, and I think the start point is to get good data that's structured. Um, also data that allows you to look at the player dynamics differently globally, because um, obviously players in Asia play consume games often very, very differently than Europeans, North America, South America, etc. Um, and having the ability to cut the data and look at trends, player trends by region, by country, and also, of course, act on those as well, um, and make sure that you're, you're linking your marketing decisions to those player insights. I think studios often have a tendency to look at, they just want to make the, or oftentimes want to focus on the, the, the content, which is great, but there's also the publishing side of it, which is once that content's inbound, how do they push it effectively in different regions with different players, all of whom may be playing and consuming the game differently. So it's a bit of a dry subject matter, but I think getting the right structure of the data gives you a good, a good foundation to, uh, to everything. Okay, that's all fantastic. Uh, I, I noticed you mentioned the boiling the ocean thing there and how you can't do that. I feel like there would be somebody who would say, oh, well, I just, uh, if, if you get a, if you get a, a, a campfire stove lar large enough, you know, somebody will probably say that. Um, so we're coming kind of into the last 10 minutes and I want to kind of hit you with the big, well, it's not necessarily the big question, but I think it's something that I think hopefully a lot of people find helpful, which is if you had to give one crucial piece of advice people who are going to bring in live ops strategy on any level, you know, if they're indie, if they're a massive company, what would you say that would be? First thing I would say, solve a problem, right? Don't just do things because other people are doing them. Think what does your game need and do that. Then think what's in it for the player and what's in it for the company. So if I want to increase monetization, um, obviously, I'll create a sale, but the sale also has to be, you think of a sale as a bonus for the payers, it has to be attractive for them. If I'm running a retention campaign over a month period, I want to see that in the end, I'm increasing my retention. But I'm also, I also want to give a great reward for the players that are committed and, and stuck through this event. So focus on a problem, tackle it, and <clears throat> think of yourself and the player constantly. Uh, I think the, the longer I work in the games industry, the more I'm convinced that time, timing is everything right. And I think starting, planning is everything as well. So starting early, I think is really, really important. Um, sometimes you see studios, particularly with the pivot that's being made or the evolution that's happening of traditional, let's say, PC and console players into live ops. They're not very good at live ops, and so they'll concentrate only on the main game and then try to bolt on the live ops part late. Um, and it just, when you design things that way, I think it just is inviting problems and issues. So it's quite difficult, you can be successful doing things that way, but I think the more integrated, as with anything in technology, I guess, the more integrated the design is early of live ops and how it's gonna sit within the game and pay off the player experience, I think the better. It's, uh, you gotta have fun with it. You gotta, you gotta make sure you're playing your game. You gotta make sure you're playing other games. So I think we forget to do that. And it's not just a business, it's, it's entertainment. You have to make sure you're consuming it and you're a player and customer as well. So it can be super simple. Some of my, two of my favorite games that I play daily are uh, Wuduko, which is by Triple Dot. And it's just like really, really simple um, daily play. And then a puzzle right now, it, it's a uh, new year. You can play through the new year levels and it's really simple live ops to get you to consume ads or it could be more complex like Marvel Snap where you're logging in for your daily uh, reward and playing a very live ops light but if you're not playing your own game you're not playing your live ops your team's not playing it for your events then how are you going to improve that experience for your fans you keep mentioning Marvel Snap so I want to let you know they're our customer and uh, you'd be surprised at how much feedback they look at when they collect it in the game. So thank you for talking about that. I'm, I'll let them know that you're noticing that. Um, from my perspective, 
Uh, support cannot be an afterthought to any game, no matter what size. And as I mentioned, it can be very scalable. So you don't have to start big. You can start small. Um, and just provide a way for players to give you feedback because how are you going to fine tune the game if you don't start collecting that feedback from day one? And then from there, you can scale at your own pace, whether it's beta or soft launch or some regional launch, um, but make sure you have that set up and get the data. I mean, your players are your best advocates and best validation for your live, live ops next steps. Uh. You must, in my opinion, also, I agree with everything because I think it's not possible to give one advice. You know, it's a chain of advices that led it. But I think just to add, it's very important that your development will be data driven right from the first date of development. So you measure everything, you do A B testing, everything you do, you try to do different hypotheses, and so on and so on. That actually can unlock your possibility to grow and understand where to go and how, because there are so many possibilities, so many games, so many mechanics that you can use, and you should be like very, very wise, and in the end, it's all about like doing your like homework math to understand that it's actually working and you going the right way. So if you don't like math, first of all, you're probably not in the right industry, but also you probably don't want to gain a live box either. <laughs> um, I just want to check how we're doing for time. Five minutes. Um, so we might. Good to go for the Q and A. Yeah. Yeah. We were thinking we might have had to cut out the Q and A, but fortunately, we have time. So, any questions? No. Nobody. Come on, come on. You've got to have something. Got somebody at the back? Can we get a microphone to him? Oh, here you go. Does this one work? Oh, this one works as well. Running, running, running. Hello. Uh, I'm not really sure what my question is. It's about uh, self-publishing and doing live ops um, yourself versus relying on other people. You've talked about tools and which tools are good. Um, you know, to what degree for like the developer, the developers up there, um, can you should you should you partner with uh, live ops? You know, publisher or someone that does that or get advisors in and uh, versus self-publishing and doing everything with tools. And I uh, hope that was a good enough question. Yeah, it's uh, the biggest challenge right now is just looking at the scope of your game and figuring out where you want to be, um, and especially around user acquisition. So that's going to be more so now than ever for independent developers, self-publishers, to try to figure out how much you're going to scale and how many um, users you're going to get in organically. And um, that, that's, that's the biggest factor that you're going to have to look at because that not only requires money, uh, it requires um, strategy and uh, where to spend it, how to spend it, uh, and expertise. So uh, that's the biggest thing you need to solve first. Uh, if you're going to self-publish and then uh, and then go from there, but what I'm also seeing is a lot of people are self-publishing uh, in bigger geos, which is also different than it used to be. Like U.S., they're publishing in only two or three countries, and they're really getting the core mechanics down pat. Then they're looking for a publisher afterwards after they really sort of hone the game and get it to a, a point where they can put live ops on it because they're able to get enough volume in order to do that. I'm pretty sure uh, Mr. Autofire did that, which is now a huge game uh, out of Finland that did that. So that's something kind of new because before it was always like, for us anyways, it was always like, once we hit US, that's our big, that's our like wor worldwide release. But now people are going to a bigger market first as a self-publisher to get enough volume so you could really look at it. And your point was excellent on data because the other thing you don't want to do is be like, oh, we have a great, you know, we have a great retention, or we're seeing a 50% uptick in uh, in this metric, but you have less than like 10,000 daily users, so it's pretty skewed. On any small bit can really like push your metrics up, right? right yeah, I, I can also oh, add okay. that basically it's very important. Uh, 
if you know your like strengths and weaknesses and whether you can fix it or not because the momentum will uh, very important if you can fix it like in two years probably it will be too late it's better to partner on something on user acquisition and publishing on uh, monetization or something and uh, if you know that you can do it okay you just need to plan it and, uh, and 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 it's very important to understand what exactly you're lacking whether it's just user acquisition or full publishing or, I don't know, co-development, maybe kind of deal and so on and so on. If you can do everything on your own, yeah, you can do it. But I actually haven't seen any companies that can do almost everything on their own and not using any other partnership. It's very difficult. And it's very difficult to hold the focus and it's very difficult to have all the right people on all the right places to actually make it like effective. All right, uh, we're going to have time for one more quick question. Um, if you have any other like questions, um, please do find our uh, speakers around the, the venue. Uh, I'm just going to come here real quick. Um, with all the changes that are going on right now, all the different aspects of vast amount of elements of uh, live ops, what AI products are out there that can assist a studio in regards to the process for live ops? <laughs> you've, done, you've done what I couldn't do, you've stumped it's, them. It's a, it's a good question because I think um, we're coming to a point now where it becomes the buzz and a lot of evolving. So, few companies that uh, I'm familiar with started using Mid Journey to create their live, op live ops art. In terms of analysis, I am. A lot of companies are offering AI platform and, and machine learning to, to improve, but to be honest, you have to take one and test. The mo most of the companies I worked for or I know, like Playtica, they've created their own in-house AI platform. So in my opinion, it, it's a great field with great opportunities, but it's still emerging. And I believe we need to give it a bit more time to test and see which one really breaks above the fold. You get all the assets with like eight fingers and stuff like that on your live <laughs> <box> thing. <laughs> Maybe it will work. <laughs> right, I think that is time. Uh, can we give a round of applause yeah. for our lovely panelists, please?